there's things that people need finances people need health you know there's just different things that are needed and um you know we i mean if we shared every testimony that we had it would just go on and on and on forever so um i just want to pray for our needs because god is here to meet our needs god is here to abundantly supply what we need whether it's uh like she was sharing you know she only had 16 hours he said you want to work more but then she asked can i have even more you know sometimes it's that asking the other thing i've seen is god has taken our talents and and what we do and given us creative ideas to bring out additional streams of income you know so many of us have all of us have something in us that we are really good at and it would help other people to be able to connect at what we're good at. So I just want to pray for finances, for healing, for uh, creative solutions, for all those different things. So y'all ready to receive? So Father, I just thank you that uh, <laughs> there is more and abundantly more. And we just want to agree with what your word says. Your word says that you give us the power to create wealth. So, Lord, we release creative solutions, creative ideas to partner with you to create finances into our household, additional streams of income. Lord, your word says that you heal the sick. So, Lord, I just am agreeing with your word. We declare your word, and we know that when we declare your word, heaven is activated upon it. So we declare healing of every sickness, every disease, every mental uh, uh, confusion, uh, bipolar and schizophrenia. We just release healing over it, over our bones, over our organs, over our bloodstreams. Like we already heard a testimony. You know, we, we declare healing. We declare jobs and more jobs. Uh, we hear that testimony. So we're putting a demand on what we've already heard, the multiplication of that. And Lord, I, I'm just asking that you open up our eyes to see, to see possibility, see potential, see um, just the yes that you have on our lives, on our anointing, on our calling, Lord. We, we want to call our families in. For, for those who don't believe, Lord, we're just calling them. We're saying that in the name of Jesus, you come and, and connect with the spirit of the living God. And that your eyes are open to Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. And that you will be saved, delivered, made new, and, and on that uh, path that he has for you. So for every brother, sister, every sibling, every child, every aunt, uncle, every distant relative, we don't care, Lord. Lord, we're, we're all carrying the bloodline of you, Jesus, and we just release that over them, that they will wake up and have a suddenly of who you are, God. So, uh, God, we just thank you that you have your very best for us, and we aren't letting go till we get the fullness of that best, Lord, and we just agree with what your word says for us. For that multiplication of the kingdom in Jesus name. Amen. We're going to do probably a, a little quicker service. I'm not sure I'm going to preach for an hour. Unless y'all don't want any lunch. I didn't see any. I didn't hear anybody say. Oh go ahead pastor. We don't care. We've already been here for two hours. It's no problem with us. Have you ever been to a service that lasts four or five hours? You know, a lot of times when you go to, uh, there's one church uh, in our region that, that their services last four to six hours every Sunday. So, uh, so <laughs> and, and, but when we go overseas, usually their services are three, four, five hours. You know, once you get going, sometimes they last all day long. But we aren't going to do an all day long service because I feel like God has done so much for us already. He's done so much for us. We're going to go to 2 Chronicles. We're going to start in chapter 17. And there's a couple of points I want to hit high on this. Because I know we're talking about there's been a divine shift. There's been a divine shift. It has already started. We're not looking for it to start. It's already here. It's already started. And where we, where we have been, we are no longer. That season has ended. We're already in the momentum of what God is doing now. 
and we are going in a place that we've never been before. And even as I read those two words over us, now I'm going to be honest with you, I would have never looked for a governmental anointing. That is not my thing. I, I do not like politics. I, I do not watch the debate. You can go ahead and send me hate emails because I get those, you know. But I do not watch the debates because they stress me out. So I, I'm not a political person, but I've had more opportunities to uh, influence the political realm than I ever thought would have happened. So sometimes God gives you things that you don't really want, but it's because he needs us in a position for the season that we're in. So whatever God wants to give us, calling forth arms and limbs, I, I don't have any problem with that, right? Uh, you know, if he wants to give us evangelism anointing where our, everyone in our office is going to be saved, every, every one of our customers, no problem. If that's his best for us, then that's what we want, whether we deem it what we are anointed in or not. Because he will give us the anointing he has for us, whether it's something that we had in our mind or not. I remember Lance Walnall sharing one time, um, he said that the Lord had moved him into the government arena and gave him influence with politicians and that type of stuff. And he, he told him, he said, why? Why would you do that to me? He said, because that's what you ask for every time you pray in tongues. That is your request. So he, it wasn't something of his mind. It was something of his spirit that that was what he was calling out for. So we're going to uh, go through Second Chronicles a little bit. And um, hmm, let's see where I was going to start. What did I say? 17. Okay. Okay, we've got King Jehoshaphat. He's taken over from his father, Asa. Uh, his father was a terrible king. He was not aligned with the Lord, even though he was the king of Judah, which should have been aligned to the Lord. When Jehoshaphat took over, he realigned Judah with what God's heart was. He reset Judah with what God's heart was. And um, it says in 17 verse 5 and 6, it says, Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, in Jehoshaphat's hand. And all of Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat, and he had riches and honor and abundance. And in the Hebrew Bible, it says in verse 6, it says, His mind was elevated in the ways of the Lord. That's what we want. We want our minds elevated in the ways of the Lord. So he had this great alignment with God. He was, he, he was rich. He was full of wisdom. He was full of honor. Everyone revered him. In fact, the, the enemies would not attack him because the fear of the Lord was on them because of who Jehoshaphat was. Now, can you imagine caring such a, a, a oneness with God that the enemy won't come near you because the fear of the Lord is so strong that they won't cross that boundary to you? What's the, let's ask for it. Come on, you know. Every time I see something that I didn't know was possible, I'm like, I need that, God. Really, we need that as the body of Christ to, to carry such honor and reverence and obedience unto God that the enemy cannot get near us because of, because of what we carry carries the fear of the Lord, and they will not cross over that boundary line. So he carried that, and then he ended up misaligning himself. You know, have you ever gotten out of sync with God? And you know what you're doing isn't quite right, but you may not know it till after you do it. So Jehoshaphat is aligned with Ahab. Ahab is the king of Israel. It's still a divided kingdom. We've got Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. We've got Ahab, the king of Israel. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but Ahab is married to Jezebel. And we're going we're gonna to hit on that in just a minute. But the bottom line is, Ahab wants to go out to fight. And he says, you know, King Jehoshaphat, since you're married to my daughter, will you go with me? And he says, yeah, I'll go because I have renown and I have honor and I have strength and I have, I have all this. I am all this. But what he doesn't realize is that 
King Ahab is not a godly alignment. Even though he's the king of Israel and he should be godly, he is not. So King Ahab is not a godly alignment. And let's uh, scoot over to uh, chapter 18. Maybe I'll get caught up with y'all and turn my Bible to that chapter. It's interesting what we learn from Scripture. Because there's these little nuggets, you know, even though I've, I've read this before, there's these little highlights that I haven't really taken fully in. You know, sometimes those misalignments like Ahab, that's a misalignment. So, you know, Jehoshaphat is rich um, in verse, um, you know, he's agreed to go out with Ahab and fight. But in verse 4, Jehoshaphat says to the king of Israel, this is Second Chronicles 18, verse 4, he says, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. So Jehoshaphat knows enough to check with God before they go out. But Ahab has a whole different level of prophets. They're just saying, yeah, go, you're going to win, don't worry about it. And, and he says, it, Jehoshaphat says in verse 6, he says, is there not still a prophet of the Lord? Now there's prophets talking, but they're not talking of the Lord. He says, is there not still a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of him? Because they want to know, Jehoshaphat wants to know what is the Lord going to say. So Ahab says, yeah, there's one. But he always says bad things about me. Hmm. Jehoshaphat says, bring him, bring him. He's like, he always says bad things. He doesn't have anything good to say. So they call him in, and, and King Ahab says, now I want you to give me a word of encouragement. He's a prophet of the Lord, but Ahab does not want to hear what the prophet of the Lord is saying. He wants to be reassured, confirmed, that what he's about to do is fine with God. So the prophet says, yeah, go ahead. You'll be victorious. And Ahab knows that is not the Lord. Because that prophet never agrees with him. And why does the prophet never agree with him? Because he is not living in the land of the Lord. He's living from his own self. It's funny, isn't it? How many would rather hear what the Lord has to say versus what's going to make us feel better? It comes and goes. You know, sometimes we want somebody to say, yeah, it's okay. But the Lord sends that word and says, no, it is not okay. So he comes in and he gives them a word. And he says, when he says, yeah, it's going to be okay. Go and prosper, verse 14. Verse uh, 16, he says, they say, tell me the truth. And he says, I saw all of Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord says, these have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. Verse 17, and the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you he would, prophesy, he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And, and, he, and the prophet goes on and says, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing at his right hand. And he left. And his left, and the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up, that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in this manner. Then the Spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said to him, In what way? I will tell him, uh, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying prophet in the mouth, lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets of yours. And the Lord has declared disaster against you. So they go through this and I'm not going to take apart the lying prophets, all that, but they go through all of this and he warns them, if you go, you will die, Ahab. They go anyhow. 
They hear the word of the Lord and they go anyhow. And the king of Israel gets Jehoshaphat to dress in all his regale while Ahab disguises himself. So when the enemy comes, they're going to kill Jehoshaphat. But the assignment of the enemy was only the king of Israel was to be killed. Only. So when they came to Jehoshaphat and realized he was not the king of Israel, they let him go. And Ahab was killed. He was killed in the battle like the Lord warned. When we think about this, and I want to share something about Jezebel in just a second, but when we think about this, I want us to really think about how the Lord speaks warning to us, how he protects and prepares us. He protected Jehoshaphat. He saw the heart of Jehoshaphat. He saw what he did for Judah. He saw his devotion and dedication. The Lord is the one who made Jehoshaphat strong. And the Lord had an additional plan for Jehoshaphat, which we'll talk about in a minute. But Ahab was an evil king. He was a king over the people of Israel, and he was evil unto the Lord. He led the people astray. And not only that, his wife Jezebel was even worse. His wife Jezebel went after Elisha, which you can read about in, in 1 Kings. She went after, in fact, Elijah. This is an interesting fact. Elijah was given the mandate to take her out, but he didn't. It ended up, Jehu ended up taking her out. So it's interesting as God begins to move us into this new position that we're in, this divine shift that we're in, that being in that close place with the Lord and surrounding yourself with people you know will hear from the Lord and will tell you the truth from the throne of God and not just tell you what you want to hear is so critical in this hour. Anybody can tell you what you want to hear. Anybody can. But to tell you the definite heart of God for you and to pray with you and to uh, intercede with you when God's got an assignment on you that's bigger than life, bigger than you, bigger than anything you can imagine, that is where we need to be. We need to be in intimate fellowship with born-again, spirit-filled believers that are invested in where God's taken you in your journey where God's taken you in your life as you are invested with them and you have to be in that obedient intimate place with the Lord to be able to discern where's the line coming from and where's the truth because all of us when we're faced with the truth of God we have the option to make the choice God's not going to make us choose him or the whole world would already be saved he's not going to make us risk and take that next step what he's going to do is he's going to keep what i call he keeps nudging and pushing and speaking and he'll send people our way that will say the same thing over and over and over again so you finally say okay i'll step and when we step the power comes with our next step, the power comes. And we're in that dynamic shift of power right now. And I want to talk about, what's her name? Jezebel for a minute. Uh, last week I had a conversation with someone, and they were talking about the principalities. We, do you understand that there, is a, there are principalities that operate in different countries, in different regions, in different nations? Well, Jezebel has been a principality over America. Definitely has been a principality. And she can't operate without Ahab's. Because they were, they were two principalities together, right? So this is an interesting thing. As I was talking to someone last week, I said, you know, we've been fighting this principality over America for a long time. At some point, we've got to win. And she has to be gone. That principality has to be gone. 
So then they sent me a word from Dutch Sheets. And he says, I just heard this word. It's on my Facebook page. It's on our gathering page. He said, I just heard this word last Sunday, the Lord. This was in September uh, during Rosh Hashanah. The next 12 days, the Lord will set up a new administration. We are watching God work. It says, I see the words flash across. A Jezebel capture will occur in October. This means someone that's pulling the strings at that gate will be removed. We say Jezebel will be captured. So we're declaring that over America because we have battled that principality for a long, long time. And, and like I said, I, I just said, Lord, at some point, we got to win. Come on. We carry the power of the Most High God. At some point, we have to win. And we receive this word. And it says that... Um, uh, we're saying this is the exposure is coming. You are about to reach down and silence some voices. We say, Lord, you're going to do this. And while you do this, you're going to show yourself strong and expose Jezebel. The claws and talents of Jezebel are going to be pulled out of the heart of this nation. That's so good, isn't it? So we just keep speaking that life over our nation. We keep speaking that that Jezebel principality has been pulled down. It has been dismantled. The, the pillars that helped it, the Ahabs that helped it stay in control have been dismantled, have been taken down. And there was one other word over this. And um, it says the uh, Jezebel, and this is all from Dutch Sheets. Like I said, it's on my Facebook page. Uh, Jezebel capture will occur. Exposure is coming. Uh, the blood of Jesus is attacking the deception and darkness. Reversal is coming. It's a season of reform. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we are, we are coming in agreement with that word. That by the end of October, that the Jezebel principality will be broken down. It will be torn down. It will be taken apart. So um, I don't even know where I was. I've kind of gotten excited about this. <laughs> okay, so once he gets out of this mess, Ahab's dead. Jehoshaphat goes back to Judah, and he, re he makes sure that everything's holy, everything's pure, everything's in line with God. He's like, that was a bad decision, and I am not doing that again. And he begins the reform which that's what we're seeing in America. We're seeing a reformation. We're seeing a revival. We're seeing things being shifted like we've never seen before. We're seeing that reform. And I want to talk just a few minutes about this reform. And this is part of the divine shift. You know that when something happens, you're in, a, 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 in the balance. You're, you're in between. It can be really dangerous for you whether in the spirit, the, the physical or emotional realm, uh, and you've got to have a way out of it. When you get that way out, like Jehoshaphat did, when he got that way out, all of a sudden, everything shifts. The momentum has shifted. No longer are you caught in the balance between what the enemy's trying to do, but you've moved out from under that, and you see the glory of God coming into you, coming through your life, and everything shifts. Everything shifts. You're able to see much clearer. That's what happened to Jehoshaphat. So he gets Judah realigned. He makes sure, you can read chapter 19, he just makes sure everybody is, you know, Standing to attention, we are pure, we are holy. There's no idols around, nothing. We're getting rid of everything that doesn't align itself with God. So when they do that, the, enemy, the enemies, there's a group of, of uh, people that decide to come against him. And they're going to attack Judah. In verse 2, it says, uh, chapter 20, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 2. It said, then some came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria. So he is about to have an onslaught of Amorites, of uh, all kinds of people that are going to try to take him out. So verse 4, it says, so Judah gathered together and asked help from the Lord. 
and from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And they go through this process of fasting and turning to the Lord. And I'll just give you a heads up. We're going to do a three-day fast from October 31st to November 2nd, the three days prior to the election. We're, we're calling a fast. You know, we've been praying and fasting for, for months coming up to it, but we're calling a fast. The Lord told me that on November 4th, we will, we will breathe a sigh of relief. And, you know, that, that once we get through this war that's being waged right now, there will be like, you know, just like this relief from all the pressures of the war. Uh, verse 5 in chapter 20, it says, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nation? And in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? That is who God is. That, who is, that is who is standing with us right now. Are you not uh, our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? That's, that is the God that is defending us, that who's standing with us. And when we align ourselves with who God is, who he says he is, what he says he's going to do, then everything else looks different. We're a, we view things through a much different view when we align, when we understand, oh God, you're our God of heaven. Nothing can withstand you. We don't, you know, all this other stuff out there is a breath to you to blow it away. So we align with you, God. And when we stand in that place of proper alignment, then everything else looks different even when we're faced with opposition it looks different even when we say god i don't know what to do about just having 16 hours this is in your hands i turn it over to you he's like great i've been waiting for it because what i got for you is so much better than what you have right now we are living in the land of fullness we are living in a land that is better. We are living under a covenant of richness. And I'm talking about richness of health, richness of mind, richness of regions. We carry the power to shift everything. It doesn't mean it's not going to be a hard push. Just like we're going to do up to the election, we're declaring God's best for our election for our nation. We're declaring what you want, God, that's what we want. We're declaring whatever you decide, that's what we're going to do. Because you have such a bigger picture than we do. You understand the beginning from the end. You understand that when this happens, then that will begin the domino of the next and the next and the next. So we don't worry about what everything is being said. We don't, we don't worry about those things. Because our God says his word will go forward. I think I say that every week, Donna. It's just so, it's imp so important right now because even when you look at uh, the political ads, even when you look at the statistics on uh, uh, the COVID, when you look at all these things, what we have to war with is the word of God. That is what we war with. You know, we can't war with the statistics. We can't war with whether, I mean, how many people could sit down through the presidential debate and the vice presidential debate and spend weeks doing fact checking? And then even when you fact check, what you look at half the time isn't even true anyhow. Amen. So, I mean, what are we fact checking? We're fact checking something ethereal out in the air that someone wrote and we don't even know if what they say is true. So all we know is what God gives us through his word. And our discernment and our wisdom comes through the word. And that allows us to make whatever the votes are that we're supposed to make, whatever the changes are in our health, whatever the things are we need to do, it is found through the word that we execute in our lives. That is the only way. That is the only way. 
It's the word of God. It says it's living. So when we read the word, life comes in us. It is blown through us. When we read the word, our mind is transformed. When we read the word, our bodies are healed. It is the word that carries the power for everything we need. We just have to come into agreement with what the word says. It is that, I mean, that really is the bottom line. And as we press into what the word says, then we are transformed according to the word. Right? Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. We're going to land this plane. Okay, this is what I want to end it with, and then we're going to have communion. But what I want to talk about is Jehoshaphat let the Lord be the person who set the battle plan. And the battle plan of the Lord was, do not be afraid. That's always God's word to us. Whatever we face, do not be afraid. He says, do not be afraid. There's two scriptures I want to read. Um, oh, here we go. It is verse 17. You need not fight this battle. That's a word for people here. You need not fight the battle. Position yourselves Stand still and see. Stand still. Position and stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah, O Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So they go out against them in verse 24, and it says, So when Judah went to the place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude and there were, what? Dead bodies falling on the ground. No one had escaped. No one had escaped. And not only that, when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, because there's always spoil from the enemy, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves more than they can carry. And they were three days. It took them three days to get all the goodness that the Lord supplied through the spoils against the enemy. Three days to carry everything out. You know, he didn't have five people helping him. They had hundreds of thousands of people carrying that stuff out. There weren't five people. If you could go back and read... The, the number of people, 860,000, my mass of petition right there. So just think about it. It took three days for 860,000 people to carry out the spoils of the enemy. Three days. What in the world, Pearl? Is our God gooder than anything? <laughs> anything. I mean, <laughs> do you want three days of spoil? Yeah. Come on. This is the shift that we're talking about. Where God has for us, we won't believe. We won't believe. And what God's going to do for us, we're going to be in awe. We aren't even get, we're going to say, can you believe it? No, I can't believe it. Would well, you see it? Yes, I see it, but I still can't believe it because the goodness of God is so fat. You know, fat in the Bible is a good thing. The fatness of the Lord, that is actually a good thing because the Lord has his fatness, his abundance, his fullness for us. And that is part of the reason we're seeing a harvest like we've never seen before. That is part of the reason we're seeing a shift in finances. And I, I read in the Wall Street Journal the other day uh, about the amount of poverty in the world because of what has happened. And I laid my hands on that, and I said, you know what? God says his word. And remember, in the Old Testament, when they were poor, what did they do? They gleamed off of our abundance. So there was more than enough for everyone. So I lay hands on that because, Lord, yes, my compassion is stirred. For the poverty in both America and, and we do what we do for in, from the gathering, from all that we give for that. But Lord, I have the power to shift their poverty into abundance because of God that I carry. We have the power to make that shift. 
We have the power of multiplication. We have the power because that's what the word of God said. I didn't make that up. I can give you a list of scriptures. That's what the word says. And when there's poverty, we make room for gleaming off of our abundance. We release that multiplication because that's who the people of God are. We shift the culture based on who we carry. And we carry the God of everything, everything, everything. So let's close with that. Um, I'm just excited that uh, we're going to see some crazy things. Yes. We think we've seen crazy things now. We've seen body parts replaced. Yeah. We've seen uh, jobs yeah. being given. We've seen debts completely paid off. You know, we've seen, I mean, we, with our eyes, with our testimonies, we have seen. I gave a prophetic word to someone about being a lunch lady. And it turns out during the COVID, she decided to start making meals for her kids so they would feel like they were in school. She started, the Lord told her, post those pictures on Facebook and on Instagram. She now has a business as a lunch lady providing meals for families at lunch and at night. (laughs) Creative ideas. God has something beyond us. She thought that being a lunch lady was a funny thing. But you know what? There's a business in being a lunch lady. And her meals look great. If she lived closer to me, she could be bringing us meals. (laughs) She's a little too far away for the Uber Eats. But (laughs) But just think about that. It seems so simple, but God has an amazing abundance for us in the simplicity. In the simplicity. But God, amen. Let's have communion. We're going to celebrate the goodness of God. We're going to celebrate. If you don't have a cup, there's one in the back in the little baskets. Did everybody get one? Okay. And there, uh, one day we're going to have a big party in Karen's backyard. She's already said it's okay. And we're just going to have a big cookout. We're going to all get together or in theirs. Yep. We're going to all get together. We're going to eat. We're going to celebrate the goodness of the Lord because uh, he has. Yeah, we've got a few people that want to be baptized because he has done great things for us. Yeah, yeah we have a few people that want to get baptized. If you've never been bapti- water baptized, uh, I would encourage that. I, you know, it's just. There's something about going under and coming up. I didn't get water baptized till I was older. You know, uh, I got sprinkled, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I just started having this burning to be immersed. And I got immersed in in North Carolina. It's called Black Mountain. And there was a river that ran between the two mountains that for over 100 years, that's where all the churches would come and baptize their people. So it just had this legacy of water. I'm sure, uh, we know it's not the same water. Don't send me any emails about that. It's not the same water. I'm not going to say it was. But there was something in the power of the immersion and coming up. There is power in that. Okay. Shoot, Jesus loves us. I woke up this morning saying, Jesus, thank you for how much you love us. It is beyond, beyond. Anything I could ever imagine, dream of, hope for, anything more than I could even understand. Jesus, thank you for loving us. Everybody got their things open. They're a little more challenging. If you're at home, get whatever you got. If you don't have juice and a wafer, it doesn't matter. Uh, Water and a peanut. I've used all kinds of things. You know, cracker. It doesn't make any difference. Jesus doesn't hold you account if you don't have the proper elements because he is the proper element and he he transforms so lord we just thank you for uh we thank you that you have sanctified and set apart your body and your blood for us that brings transformation to us that open the door of eternity for us And God, not only do we look forward to eternity, but we look forward to your body and your blood transforming 
our culture. So God, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. And we take your body that was given for us. God, we thank you for your body. And we do this in remembrance of you. And we take your cup, your cup of the new covenant, the blood that's been poured out for us, the blood that breaks every chain of the demonic the blood that heals our body, that saves us, that sets us for eternity and makes us a new creation. We take this in remembrance of you. And Lord, we just thank you that you have set the beginning from the end and we are alive in this beautiful season to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And we bless and honor you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.